I'm going to ask Sheikh uh, Yasser Qadi to read out the questions, and as he read out, reads out the questions, to then uh, answer those questions, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, <clears throat> most of these questions are actually of a personal nature, uh, so I don't mind answering them. But I do want to uh, begin by stating that it is not my methodology for those who listen to my lectures or follow me on, on YouTube or Facebook. It is not my methodology to engage too much with critics uh, for many reasons. Of them, frankly, because I honestly believe that uh, and I, may Allah protect me from arrogance, but I honestly believe that my ego is not worthy of me having to defend it. There are far more important things in the ummah than me having to respond to critics. Uh, I also believe that uh, by and large, uh, criticism is something that is a part of human life and nature, and that we have ourselves to accomplish more than just responding to what people say about us. And I also learned from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, and mark my words here, and I have lived with this for 20 years of my life, giving da'wah, and I continue to live with it, insha'Allah. The best way to silence the speech of the critics is through the deafening noise of your own actions. And this is the methodology I have lived by for 20 years, and inshallah, I pray to continue to live by. I don't like getting involved with the petty issue of these things. Nonetheless, sometimes people do ask, and I try my best to be as generic as possible in my responses. Also realize that criticizing is the job that requires zero qualifications. And the best example for this is when you guys watch your sports. And yesterday was a major loss. I'm not going to get it very sensitive here. Okay, I don't know what side you guys are on. But no doubt, as you were watching the match yesterday, Many amongst you said, oh my God, I could have done that. Why didn't you do this? Anybody could have, you know, taken the ball. No, you couldn't have. And if you had been on the pitch and on the field, well, you know what would have happened, right? Anybody can be a critic. You don't need any qualifications. And criticizing others does not build anything. Criticizing others destroys and it does not build. So I try my best to minimize my own criticisms and also to minimize wasting my time with also responding to critics, but sometimes just to be generic about these things. So people are asking about a lecture about moderation, seven questions about me. Number one, some people claim you don't respect senior scholars of the ummah. Can you please explain? La hawla la quudsa billah. The scholars are the inheritors of the prophets, al-ulama wa ratatul anbiya. And anybody who disparages scholars of Islam, disparages Islam. And anybody who says, don't turn to the scholars and don't listen to the scholars is setting up the ummah for disaster. However, what this misinterpretation and misunderstanding is, is that what I am saying, ask scholars who are aware of your situation. That is very different than saying, don't ask scholars. Ask ulama who understand your needs, your dynamics. And there are a million and one examples that I can give, and classical fiqh can be quoted. Ibn al-Qayyim himself said that half of fiqh is understanding the context of the fatwa. Half of fiqh is to understand the context of the person asking the question. And there are so many examples that can be given, and I don't want to bore you with the details. I simply want to say this is simply not true. All I am saying, go to ulama. I didn't say go to the baker and ask your fatwa from him. Go to ulama who understand the situation you're living in. And again, I don't wish to uh, praise your local ulama and scholarship, but mashallah, Allah has blessed you with a great imam in your midst, a great scholar in your midst. It's your job to go to him. Now, if Sheikh Abdul Qayyum himself feels stumped, I don't know what to do. It's his job to go to ulama in other lands and countries. You should ask local scholars because Sheikh Abdul Qayyub understands your situation. He understands you and your culture and dynamics. If you ask somebody from another, land, another country, they might not fully understand what is going on here. And they might give a fatwa that is more appropriate to their societies than it is. And yes, there are differences in the minutiae of fiqh from culture to culture and land to land. Anybody who denies this, I'm not saying the haram and halal changes. I'm saying the finer details change. The finer details of law, the finer details of interaction, they change. And what we call masalih and mafasid, which are pros and cons, they must be weighed in accordance with the reality of the situation. 
Let me give you a very simplistic scenario. And again, it is not related to fiqh. I'm just trying to make you understand the, the issue here. Suppose your London underground system was going under renovations. And one of the lines, what is it? Piccadilly line. I don't know. I'm not that well familiar. The Piccadilly line is closed, okay? Now, would any of you think that it is worthwhile to call up a sheikh and say, Sheikh, the Piccadilly line is closed. Should I go, give me another line. Central. District line, central line, do this, do that. Now, suppose the Sheikh actually knows the underground, he has a map. He will tell you, okay, take the underground here, take the Piccadilly, take this, take that. You yourself will say, no, but Sheikh, if I take the central, it'll take me five minutes to transfer from this train to that train. It actually makes sense that the map wouldn't tell you, I know because I've been on the underground, I actually take, give me another line, red line. The district line. I take the district line and the transfer will be easier for me. Even though from the map it looks like I'm going further away. Now, obviously the situation is not that simplistic. But what I'm telling you, most of your fiqh involves a bit of Islam and a bit of Piccadilly line. That's what I'm trying to get across to you, right? Sheikh, I have a co-worker who is such and such. Sheikh, I want to do this business transaction. Now, the Sheikh's country, if you call overseas, there is no haram business at all, let's say. And in your country, 99% of the stuff is haram. You're trying to do the least haram. You understand? From his perspective, it's all haram. So the fatwa that you will get will not be realistic, even though the sheikh might be right from what he is saying. Whereas if you go to Sheikh Abdul Qayyum, Sheikh Abdul Qayyum takes, mashallah, you take the district line, right? <laughs> you take Piccadilly, you understand? That's all I'm saying. Now, if you disagree and you want to make long distance calls, that's your business. I'm not saying astaghfirullah, it's wrong to do so. I'm simply saying what the sharia teaches us is that ulama are those who understand the text and the context. That's what I'm saying. And if Sheikh Abdul Qayyum does not know an issue, he has the context with far greater ulama. It's his job to outsource, not yours. You should not be jumping over Sheikh Abdul Qayyum, calling up somebody in Timbuktu or Saudi Arabia and saying, Sheikh, we have a local Imam Abdul Qayyum who said XYZ. No, you go to Sheikh Abdul Qayyum and to the local scholars here. And those scholars, if they have the need to, they will go higher reference. This is the hierarchy that common sense and Islamic law dictates. And I don't think astaghfirullah, this is disrespect. I think it is respecting the scholars according to what Allah Azza wa Jal has given them. This is the response to the first one. The second personal question here, which I'm very tickled at, to be honest, I'm very, really find this very funny. Is it true that one of your scholars and sheikhs at university was Tony Blair? <laughs> I didn't know Tony Blair became sheikh. <laughs> and I didn't even consider him to be a scholar. He is a politician. He's an pri ex-prime minister of yours. And yes, it is true that I took a course with him at Yale University. Him and other uh, professors were there. And it was not about Islam or tafsir or hadith or fiqh. Tony Blair is not going to teach me hadith and fiqh. The, the course was entitled Faith and Globalization. And it was about faith and globalization. And the role of religion in the common world. It wasn't just about Islam. It was about the role of religion in the, the common, in, in the modern world. And I wrote an article, uh, you can read it, it's called To Blair or Not To Blair? That is the question. <laughs> Google it. To Blair or Not To Blair? That is the question. And you can see my entire perspective and frame of mind. And I swear by Allah, if I were able to take a class with Bush or Blair or anybody, I would do so again. Because I think it is a part of the sunnah to engage with these people. When the Prophet saw Abu Talib, Abu Fir'a, sorry, Abu Jahad or Abu Lahab, did he turn away and flee? Or did he engage with them? And I don't want to boast in praise, but subhanallah, who amongst you, and you are British citizens living in this land, who amongst you can claim to have said directly to Tony Blair's mouth and in front of his face that if you believe in a God, you are going to have to answer to him on the day of judgment for what you've done to the people of Iraq. I swear by Allah, who can say that from amongst you? I can say that, alhamdulillah. I can say that, that I said that straight to his face. And I want to challenge anybody to come and tell me that that is un-Islamic. I said it straight to his face. I made him angry and flustered. But I told him straight to his face. And I quote, if you believe in a God, you're going to have to answer to him on the day of judgment for what you've done to Iraq. This is the sunnah. This is what I'm supposed to do. Now somebody comes and says that 
you are deviated because you have attended a class with Tony Blair. SubhanAllah, did you not go through school over here? Were you not taught by people who don't believe in God? Did you not go through university? Were all of your teachers, mashallah, practicing Muslims with full beards and niqabs? I mean, what world are you living in? Our Prophet benefited from secular knowledge from the non-Muslims. He said that I wanted to forbid you from ghila. Ghila is a particular act. But then I saw the Romans and the Persians doing ghila, and it didn't harm them, so go ahead and do it. Now, ghila is something not related to it. But what did he say? I saw the Romans and Persians doing it, and it didn't harm them. He's benefiting from the secular knowledge. And knowledge that is generic in nature, you learn it from anybody and everybody. And by the way, Tony Blair was not the, the scholar, we had other scholars. He was the politician. The point was melding politics with religion. He was supposed to represent the polit politician side, and there were scholars there. And yes, I did benefit from that class. And yes, I benefited being in the presence of this Taghut Fir'aun. And he is Taghut and he is a Fir'aun. I benefited from his presence by seeing many things, including the, the gift of eloquence. As our Prophet ﷺ said, verily eloquence is a type of magic. And there is no denying that this person has been given some of that magic. I hate the guy, I despise him, but I would take another class with him because I want to get the point across to him that what he did was wrong. And if I had the chance, I would do it with any other uh, non-Muslim or any other person of this nature. And I don't care of the criticism of the uh, critic in this regard. Uh, moving on, some relevant questions. What is the middle way regarding evolution? So, I have given a lecture on evolution as well. You'll find it online. Uh, you can just YouTube evolution and Yasir Qali. And in a nutshell, anybody who says that uh, the Quranic story is not true, that there is no Adam and Eve, then this is very dangerous because this is a rejection of what Allah has said in the Quran. And we do not interpret stories to be metaphorical, to be symbolic. Why? Because Allah says, this is the position of those who reject Allah. That they say, in illa These are only fables and legends. We do not interpret the Quran allegorically. When Allah has said in over 12 different occasions in the Quran, He has described the story of Adam, and He has said that He has created us from Adam, then this is not symbolism. There was an Adam. And Adam was created by Allah Azza wa Jal directly because Allah says we have fashioned him, we have shaped him. At the same time, modern science tells us certain things that are a little bit problematic. Now is not the time to immerse them together, but I have presented a theory that I think is somewhat in the middle between uh, those who, I'm, I don't want to say, uh, those who don't want to engage with modern science, those who simply want to insist, okay, we will accept the story, but then what do we do to the evidence? I accept the story of Adam and Hawa, and I don't at all allegorically interpret it. But what do we do with the evidence that seems to suggest otherwise? I have a theory, and to be very simplistic, and it's not controversial, don't worry. I say it's not problematic for a Muslim to believe that evolution is true for non-humans, for other creatures. There's no problem in that theologically. That Allah created chickens and cows and horses and dogs via this mechanism. If somebody says it, I don't say it, I'm saying if somebody says it, Islamically there's no problem. But when it came to Adam and Hawa, there was a miracle performed. And miracles cannot be proven scientifically. And I gave the example of Jesus, because Allah gives this example. The example of Adam is the example of Jesus. I gave the example of Jesus in that lecture. And I said, imagine, Imagine if Maryam السلام, lived in a modern world, imagine, and she comes to the doctor pregnant, and the doctor does the, cat, the, the, the scans and the pregnancy tests and the CAT scans and looks at the radar and everything and sees the fetus developing. Maryam says, oh, but uh, I didn't have any relations. Now you tell me, what will modern science say? Obviously, modern science is not going to believe Maryam. But what is happening with Maryam? It is a miracle. So we believe it cannot be proven. It cannot be shown rationally and scientifically. So, Allah says, the example of Adam is the example of Jesus. Both were miracles. Both were breaks in the natural way. Both were things above and beyond what can be proven. So the one who doesn't believe in the story of Adam really should not believe in any miracles. Because that's only the logical thing. Anybody who believes in miracles, well then, the story of Adam is the greatest miracle. Why shouldn't there be a miracle? Allah says in the Quran that the creation of the heavens and earth is a bigger miracle than the creation of man. But most of mankind do not uh, understand and realize. Um, what, what is the... 
Let me try to be very... So we have some very difficult questions here, and I don't want to mention the country's name, but what is the wasat manner to deal with what is happening in various lands? And they mention a number of, of, of lands here. Look, brothers and sisters, once again, I want to be very specific about how we attain scholarship in Islam. If this land is not your land, if you are not familiar with the inner dynamics of the land, let the scholars of that land talk about the best way to deal with it. And you will always find a spectrum of opinion amongst the scholars of that land. You will always find a spectrum. As long as you remain within this spectrum and you find some scholarship, then this is good. But the problem comes when you think you know better than the people that are on the ground, that are on the, the, in, the, in the actual area over there, and you disregard all the scholarship. It's one thing to pick and choose among scholars. That every intelligent person does. It's another thing to reject all scholarship. My position is that each one of these lands, you will find, alhamdulillah, ulama who have common sense. Not every alim understands politics. Some ulama do, some ulama don't. That's not, a dis that's not disrespectful to say. Does every alim understand science? No, it's not his job. He didn't study science. Some ulama understand, some ulama don't. That's not disrespectful. Similarly, some ulama understand modern politics. Others don't. So it's your job to, to put the alim in his place. Don't make the alim above and beyond the level that Allah has given him. And for many of these issues, you will find, alhamdulillah, people who are giving you the middle way. I don't talk about what people should do in Bangladesh or Egypt or Syria as much. I only give generics. I am living in the West and I can comment more on what we are doing here in the West and in particular in America. And I believe that inshallah what we are preaching is a middle path and middle road. Neither are we taking on the governments with all violence and, 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 and evil and, and, and bloodshed, nor are we quietists, pacifists, and we let them arrest and we let them in prison. We speak and we speak the truth, but we don't act foolishly. We are opposed to our governments even as we recognize there's a lot of good as well in some of these governments. Let us be fair. We should speak the truth. The very fact that we're allowed to preach and speak the truth by and large, I know there are exceptions, and I know some people have gone to jail for preaching, but by and large, I am not even a Britisher, and I can criticize the British government and criticize politicians and still come to your country freely back and forth. And this is something that is a positive that I could not do in some Muslim lands. Should this not be acknowledged as a positive that certain areas of freedom are there? And there are other areas that are positive, there are others that are negative. So the point is we as Muslims follow the middle nation. We criticize what is worthy of criticism in a manner that is the most effective. And we do not go beyond the bounds. I am very much opposed to militancy and terrorism. And I, and I don't say this because the government is telling me to say it. I say this because I believe our religion preaches this. I am opposed to blowing things up and killing people that have nothing to do with any other crime. I am opposed to this. At the same time, I also say the cause for this anger is foreign policy and not because of the Quran. The reason why these people are so angry, they want to blow themselves up, is because of what our own governments have done. بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ so we criticize the one and we criticize the other. I'm neither on this side nor on that side. Yet we stand up for the truth, we preach the truth, and we criticize both sides for their excessiveness. And it is a moderate and delicate balance. It's difficult. We're very angry at Palestine and Israel, what's happening. We're very angry at so many other foreign policies. At the same time, let us acknowledge the good as well. Let us acknowledge so many positives of this land. And, and alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us to be living relatively comfortable lives. The freedom to think, the freedom to act, the freedom to do things. We thank Allah for this. We thank Allah for this. And we also criticize where criticism is due. And I believe this is somewhat of a moderate path. Final point I want to say. Look, brothers and sisters, everybody is a human. I'm a human. Sheikh Abdul Qayyim is human. You're all human. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes you make mistakes. Scholars are not infallible. If you find a mistake in me or in any other scholar, there is a proper methodology to deal with it. Deal with it and look at the positive as well. To concentrate only on the negative is not a part of Islam. You look at the positive, you look at the negative, and you see overall what is the best way to correct this methodology. I am a human being and I will make mistakes. I have made mistakes. I will continue to make mistakes. 
But I pray to Allah that Allah makes my mistakes insignificant compared to the good. And I ask you, if you find such a mistake, make dua to Allah to forgive and then correct in a positive, in a manner that is productive for the uh, ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always cause us to be followers of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, respectful of our ulama, following the salaf of this ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to live as Muslims, to die as mu'mins, and to be resurrected with the Anbiya. Ya and the Siddiqeen and the Shuhan and the Salihin. Wa hasunu laika rafiqa. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.